Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church, and our partners in ministry. We're just so grateful to be here today, and I have uh, really experienced a tremendous blessing of the Lord, and uh, that's why I got to sing one of my songs, and it's going to make some of the members pull their hair out, but Pastor Old School, and um, I, uh, I haven't had a voice uh, most of the week, but got one today, so I feel good, 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 I feel good down in my soul, every time I think about Jesus, it makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. I feel good, good, good. I feel good down in my soul. Every time I think about Jesus, it makes me feel good. I stepped in the water. The water was cold. It chilled my body, but not my soul. Every time I think about Jesus, I feel good. Talk about me as much as you please. The more you talk, I'm going to bend my knees Cause every time I think about Jesus I feel good Oh, I feel good, good, good I feel good down in my soul Every Time I think about Jesus, it makes me feel good. Bless the Lord, church. Bless the Lord, all of our partners. I am so grateful uh, that the Lord has uh, <clears throat> given me a portion of health and strength and my voice is uh, still coming back, but I'm grateful today. I'm so grateful. Uh, you only, If you only knew uh, how God has uh, intervened on my behalf, and I am just giving him praise and honor. Today, we're going to have a town hall meeting at 11.15, and we invite all of our uh, local members to join us uh, so that we can give you an update on our potential uh, return dates, and uh, I give you an opportunity to ask questions at that time. Uh, we also, I would ask you to uh, pray for Sister Diane Carroll. She had death in her family. Uh, if you get an opportunity just to reach out to her, uh, feel free to do that and minister to her in ways that New Direction uh, knows how to show the love of Christ. Um, please continue to join us during our Wednesday night Bible prayer and uh, Bible study. Uh, this week, there are ministries that are still going on. Uh, if you're unsure, uh, please contact uh, your ministry leader and find out ways that you might be able to be a part of what God is, what God is actually doing. And the final thing I want to say before we uh, jump into the word, uh, if you have not reached out to encourage someone from the family of God that is a part of New Direction Bible Family, uh, please uh, don't underestimate the importance of your call and just being yielded to the Holy Spirit. And as I said, one thing, but I want to just encourage all of you who have been partnering with us in giving uh, to the building of the kingdom of God as we are preparing to uh, watch the construction of our family life center uh, in, New, in, in Middletown, Delaware. Uh, don't allow yourself to be left out of the giving aspect 
uh, building the kingdom of God. Uh, we're going to have a powerful uh, learning center and uh, other ministries in our Family Life Center in Middletown. So <clears throat> uh, feel free to participate <clears throat> in the ways that my wife encouraged you to through those uh, mediums of, of giving. <clears throat> now turn with me to uh, Philippians, Philippians chapter uh, 2 of, of verses, uh, verses, I need water, amen. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each one esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come to you thanking you for an open door. Uh, that we have through prayer. Uh, you said, come boldly unto the throne of grace where we can obtain mercy to help us in the time of need. We need you right now, O God, and we bless you, O God, that we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but Jesus was tempted in all ways like as we are, yet without sin. We got, we God, we come asking you to strengthen us. Father, we ask that you would continue to uh, speak to speak to our nation, O oh God, and that whatever you need to do to bring us back to yourself in a spirit of repentance for restoration, God, we, we, get, we are standing here calling out to you, knowing that you always do what is best for you know what is best. You are the sovereign God. We praise you and we thank you. In Christ's name, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> During uh, <clears throat> my second semester, uh, at Cheney uh, State University, two of my <clears throat> closest friends uh, convinced me to audition uh, to sing in the Cheney State University Choir. It took a real light lot of effort on their part to persuade me to try out for the choir, even though I've always, for as long as I can remember, I've enjoyed singing and I love singing. But the main issue was, for me, and for most, was the person that was in charge of the choir and the music department as a whole. His name was Dr. Jack Moses. We called him D-Jack. Now, he led by strict and unapologetic intimidation. Nothing except physical force or abuse was off the table. He talked about your mama, he cussed you out, he threw you out. Uh, it was rough being in a room with Dr. Jack Moses. Now the interesting thing is that he was mostly sarcastic and, and humorous and anybody that attended Cheney know that Mr. Moses had your best interest at heart. He was trying to uh, in his toughness, get the most out of you by way of excellence. And he is actually one of the legends, in case one of his relatives is listening and watching today, he's actually one of the legends of Cheney State University. Uh, now, if you were a major, if you majored in music, you didn't have an option. You had to sing the choir. And so I believe that one of the reasons he always had choir members is that it was an obligation for all music majors who could sing. Now, Miss Moses looked like a lion. His eyes were this brown, like a golden brown, the same color of his skin. And he had a full mange. I, I'm, I'm calling his hair a mange, all pulled back with just, uh, you looked at him and often you didn't expect for words to come out, you expected. Uh, the roar of a lion. When it came time for me to try out, <clears throat> Mr. Moses called me, hey, come young man. And he said something like, I knew you before your father was plotting on you. Some, some craziness. Before your mom was even a twinkle in your dad's eye, I knew you. Don't look at me that way. So he calls me up and he said, why are you here? You look like you're lost. And 
I was able to say, I'm here to try out for the choir, and now you're, you're nervous, and you want to walk out the room. And then he says, now I want you to listen to these keys that I'm going to play on the piano, and when I tell you what to sing, I want you to do exactly what I said, and the three things that are necessary, you needed to be able to hear a note, you couldn't be tone deaf, you had to be able to sing in tune, and you had to be able to hold a note. So he plays some keys on the board and <clears throat> on keyboard, and then he says, unlike with the others, I was expecting him to say, sing do re mi va, do me re fi fo, do me re fi fo, and he would do it on an elevated level. He'd start do re mi my fo, so la ti do, and he'd keep going faster and higher, et cetera, to see what your range was. But instead of telling me to do a do re mi fi fo, he said, I want you to do me, 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 me. So I'm, I'm not sure why he asked me to change. And uh, to my uh, surprise and, and relief, after I followed uh, his instructions and demonstrated I wasn't tone deaf, I could hear a note and, and, and hold a note, he said I was ex accepted into the choir. So he said, go sit down, boy. And then I returned to my seat. And I was now a member of the Cheney State University Choir. Now, while the me, 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 me exercise works well for choir auditioning and it got me accepted, it has no place in the church. Uh, the me spirit in the life of the church causes division disappointment, and can even lead to the total destruction of a ministry. The me spirit in Christians' lives uh, has destroyed many marriages, cost many jobs, and has left broken relationships. What we call meism God calls pride. In fact, the Bible says the seven things that God hates in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 19, uh, chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, at the very top of the list, God says, there's six things that I hate. Yes, seven are an abomination to me. And the first of the seven things that God says that he hated is a proud look. God hates pride. And often we cloak the spirit of pride in what we call being ambitious, uh, uh, being assertive, showing confidence, standing up for ourselves. And while none of those things are wrong, we need to absolutely be clear that we're not really under the control of a meism spirit or a spirit of pride because God, God despises pride. Throughout the Bible, God warns us of the danger of the me, 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 me spirit. Proverbs 16, verse 8, it says, Pride goes before the fall. In Proverbs 29, verse 23, God says, I will bring the proud low. Daniel chapter 5, verse 10 or verse 20, it says, pride hardens the heart against God. It hardens our heart against God. That's one of the reasons that it's so dangerous. It makes us hard in our hearts towards God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 18, Peter is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, God gives grace to the humble, but he aggressively intentionally, purposefully opposes and resists the proud. The sin of pride is essentially or especially destructive, as I've already mentioned in the church. And so I want to share as our key foundational passage, underline this in your Bible. If you haven't uh, clicked on for somebody to uh, join in sharing, do that right now. This is going to be 
a powerful word for the church today. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, the Apostle Paul, writing from a, uh, writing from a prison cell, he sends these words to the church at Philippi. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, meekness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for our own interest, but also for the interest of others. Esteem the interest of others more highly than your own. I believe that America's greatest sin is pride. It's pride. Pride is what's keeping many Americans from wearing a face mask that could save as many as 33,000 lives. I believe that it is pride that has caused the, the most economic and technologically advanced nation in the world to be driven to her knees by COVID-19. And as I've already said, God takes human pride personally. It is an affront to him. It's kind of like picking a fight with God. And the scripture says that it is a fearful thing, a terrorizing thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And so what we don't want to do, and I believe, and as I already have said, things are not going to get better in America because this is not about COVID-19. This is about God bringing this nation to her knees in repentance so that he can restore us. And the sin that we need to confess across the cities and states of this country is the sin of pride. Now, what is pride? The Greek word that is translated in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, conceit and boast. Uh, are, uh, for pride, it's translated or rendered in our English Bible as, as conceit. Or it also can be rendered with the word boast. And it simply means this, to have an excessively favorable opinion of one's own abilities importance, intelligence, social status, credentials, etc. It, it, it is to have an excessive, overly confident, favorable opinion of yourself. That's what pride is. And the Lord says through Paul, don't allow anything that you do to be motivated by an excessive, favorable opinion of yourself. Now, some, uh, someone, um, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, very powerful passage, and he, he, he says, if anybody had a basis to feel justified, to be conceited and arrogant and full of himself, Paul said, it would be me. And then he goes through a list of all of the accomplishments. And this man was a stunningly brilliant, articulate, multicultural, a prolific writer. Uh, he accomplished so many things in his life. And he and he, he could go all the way back to the beginning of his lineage. And he says, even though I have these kinds of things that I can put on my resume that are actually true, Paul says, I put no confidence in my flesh. I do not have an excessively favorable opinion of me. I put no confidence in my flesh. Now, there are two types of pride in the, in the Bible that I want to talk about. Uh, uh, from the outset. The first is a God, there's a godly pride. There's pride that is not sinful. It's not wrong and God doesn't speak against it. And we read about that in Romans chapter 
12, verse 3, where the Apostle Paul writing again, he says, for the grace that is given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. See yourself from the lens of who you are in God. In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So Paul says we need to have a godly assessment of ourselves. And when we do, we will think properly. And one of the proper things that we should be proud of is that God says in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and marvelously made. You don't have to apologize about that. You are the result of God's handiwork. Paul adds in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, you have been created by the master for good works. You are a masterpiece from the master himself. You ought to feel encouraged and, 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 and feel open to receiving compliments and promotions and, and, and other accolades for a job well done. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said, For I am crucified with Christ. I'm dead in Christ. But nevertheless, I live. And so it's not only God at work in us, it's God working through us. That's why the scripture says, work out your own soul's salvation. You must work out what God has already worked in. And as I am working under the power of the Spirit of God, and the results bless him and bring glory to him, I can celebrate that accomplishment. And it's not unspiritual to just say to somebody who said, job well done, say thank you. Just say thank you. Now, don't be like the sister who, who uh, sung at a church and God just used her so powerfully and people were brought to tears and souls came to Jesus. It was just an incredible move of the spirit. And one man approached her and he said, what an amazing job you did. Oh, it was so, uh, such a blessing. And she said, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. And he said, I could have sworn I saw your lips moving. It's not an act of humility to it, to fail to acknowledge that God not only works in us, but he works through us. And so you can say thank you when you've done a good job, understanding that apart from him, we can do nothing. And so we're not taking all the credit. We gave God glory and we can celebrate as his children that he would allow us to be instruments in his hands. Somebody say amen. Then there's ungodly pride. This is the pride that seeks to elevate self-interest above the word and the will of God. Self-interest is the most important thing. And, and, and people like that, including myself, when the spirit of pride is in control, I will put my ambitions, my desires, my agenda, my plans above God's will and word for my life. That's pride in action. It seeks to take credit for something God has accomplished. Ungodly pride demands the spotlight. It demands attention. It, it, it cries out for recognition. It has to be first. Ungodly pride craves power and status and titles. What makes ungodly pride wrong aside from it diminishes the importance of the word of God. Ungodly pride also seeks to rob God of his glory that really is his alone. Now pride is essentially, if you really want to boil it down to what it is, it is self-worship. Pride is a form of idolatry. You are bowing down at the altar of your flesh. I am bowing down at the altar of my own personal decrees. I have taken the, the place of God in my life when pride is ruling. 
Pride causes us to forget that every good and perfect gift comes from God. In James chapter 16, verses chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, here's what the word of God says. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Now, the fact that we have to be reminded not to be deceived, not to be tricked, not to be lured away, not to be baited and lured into the temptation of pride makes it very clear that this is a human struggle. It doesn't matter how long you've been walking with Jesus. The spirit of pride resides in all of our bosom. It's like an untamed lion looking for an opportunity to break out of its cage, to devour, to impress, to be important. Be not deceived, my beloved brother. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of heavenly lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is not unpredictable. He's not fickle. He doesn't give us bread. He doesn't give us a stone when we need bread. He blesses us with the sun and the rain, irregardless to even when we, irregardless to if we're walking with him or not. But we want to be very careful that we're not bowing down to the altar of our flesh. Now, there are two specific types of negative pride that we often will find ourselves struggling with. And the first is the, the sin of the, the, the sin of superiority, the, 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 the sin of having a superiority complex. This causes us to look down on others that we feel that are not, they ain't on our level. They can't get with us. It allows us to justify prejudice, excluding people from our group, not for biblical or godly reasons, but for carnal gain. It excludes people. It, it likes, and here's some examples of how we can exclude people. Uh, for non-biblical reasons, it, like we exclude people by, because of pride, because of their age, their income, their education, their lack of material possessions. They can't compare to what we have. And why would we associate with somebody that doesn't, can't help me get to where I'm going? Uh, we, we, uh, we operate in the, peer, the spirit of superiority, which is a form of pride, by judging people or treating them as if we're superior based on their gender. Uh, there has been a double standard for many years where women were treated as second class citizens and, and also uh, people of color. Uh, you, we judge people on the basis of their, the color of their skin, the texture of their hair. A person's of failures and flaws. We know things about people that they've done. And because we know, we never allow them to forget it. And that information gives us a standing in our mind that somehow they're, they're beneath us. That's a spirit of superiority that somehow we are above others. This strutting peacock spirit loves church. And religion, and I should say religious activity, love coming to church, love being involved in activities, but have no real love for ministry. Pride does not love ministry. Pride uses the platform of ministry to display the flesh. Now, a perfect example of this is in Luke chapter 18, verses uh, starting in, in, in verses 10 and through 11, where we have an example of a very prestigious religious leader. He was a Pharisee, and, and the Bible says uh, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. Now here's the spirit of superiority on display. The Pharisee stood and he, he's at church and in the synagogue and he, and he prayed, he says, thus with himself. Obviously he was praying to the Lord, but when God uh, interprets his motive, uh, it actually is not a prayer to God, it's a prayer 
at the idol or the altar of the human flesh. The Pharisee stood and he prayed to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. And then he gets real personal. Or even as this tax collector. Now, let me show you, Lord, why you ought to be impressed with me. What makes me above and superior and beyond? And one of your spiritual elite, he says, I fast and pray. I give tithes of all of my possessions. Now, it wasn't required that uh, you had to give tithes of all your possessions. But this man went above and beyond. And so he patted himself on the back as he compared himself with the tax collectors and others that he looked down on. He had a spirit of superiority, which is the spirit of pride. And the interesting thing, as I've already mentioned, he was praying and he even used the name of God. And, and I'm sure he did this was in his own mind, a very impressive prayer. But the, but the prayer was a, was a self-addressed envelope. It didn't go any higher than the ceiling. He prayed to God, but God says, you really, when you are operating in the spirit of, of pride, that prayer I don't hear in heaven. Pride will make you think that your stuff don't stink. Because you have, and I bet we have, let me put myself in there. I have a better than their, they spirit. Pride will blind you to your, our, will blind us to our personal sin and need for forgiveness. This Pharisee, he didn't see any need to ask God to forgive him because he didn't have any sin. And he had categorized sin as extortion and, and, and tax gathering and in his mind, it was this dirty dozen list of sins, but his life uh, was, was, was blameless, and therefore, there was no need for him to confess. Pride will blind us to our own sin. It will make you think that your way is the only way. It causes us to feel like if we don't do it, it won't be done right, because how could it be done right? I didn't do it. It can't be good. I know it sounds like a great idea, but how could it be a good idea if it didn't come from my brain? If I didn't initiate the thought. Pride will make us think that it has to be done our way. It has to come from us. I remember when the apostles uh, were with Jesus and they saw a group of men prophesying and they asked Jesus, can we go back and rain down fire on them? Cause they don't go to our church. And Jesus said, I wish there were more prophets. And so they had this spirit of superiority. We hang with Jesus. We his boys. And the Lord said, they don't have to be at our church to be a part of what I'm doing in the world. The priority of the Christian life is not to be better than other people. It's to be like Jesus. Let me say that again. The priority of the Christian life is not to be better than others, to compare ourselves with others, but to be conformed to the image of Jesus. He is the standard. And here's what Jesus said. He said, I am gentle and humble in heart. If you make, if you take my yoke of humility and gentleness upon you, you will find rest for your soul. You want to find rest from the tension of trying to, to be in this particular level of a spiritual st the stratosphere that will allow you to have some kind of elevation over others. Jesus said, take this, my spirit, which is the spirit of meekness and humility. And when we walk in meekness and humility, he said, then in me, you will find rest. Humility and gentleness brings rest because you have nothing to prove, nothing to lose. Because all that you are is because of him. We are complete in Jesus. Let me, let me run on. And here's the, the, the second form of pride. It's not superiority. It's the spirit of inferiority. I don't measure up to some, where you say, I don't measure up to some man-made standard. I'm nothing. I'm, I'm a piece of trash. Please step on me. Please spit on me. On me. Please, please ignore me. Please uh, make me feel that I'm nothing. 
you feel when you have a spirit of inferiority, when we have a spirit of inferiority, our best is never good enough. It doesn't matter what your grade is, what promotion you get, how much recognition people give you. In your mind, it still doesn't measure up. Somehow it falls short. When you have the sin of inferiority, you, we are dominated by self-defeating thoughts of rejection. And sometimes they're just in our head. It's imagined. Other times we actually are uh, rejected by others. It's real. But those, those experiences that we should be able to process because I'm looking at myself not from the vantage point of men because man looks at the outward appearance and God looks at the heart. We should be able to dismiss them. But when you don't think right about yourself, when you don't, as Jesus says, the second and the greatest of the two, Ten Commandments is to love others as you love yourself. If you don't have proper self-love, you're going to feel that the best you can do is never good enough. What makes us prideful, what makes inferiority prideful, how can this be prideful? Because your attention is always on you. It's self-centered thinking. It blinds you to the needs of what is what, of others and what, what, what God is doing around you. You can't see because when inferiority is dominating, we spend most of our time licking our wounds and feeling victimized and justifying why we can't do what God already equipped us to do. King Saul was chosen by God. The Bible talks about how he was the tallest of all of the other uh, members of his tribe, the Benjamites, he was a handsome guy. He went to the, he had access to the best schools, the best uh, clothes. His, his dad was rich. He's a military leader. He came from fine stock. He was gifted by the Lord, filled with the Holy Spirit. And Saul, he lived a life of torment because he, he always thought that his best was not enough. He died never enjoying or celebrating what God was not only doing in him, but through him. The spirit of inferiority prevents you from really celebrating the great things that God has allowed to happen through the gifting that he's given to you. You can't, you can't have a spiritual birthday party for yourself because you're too busy waiting for something to go wrong, too busy trying to justify why it shouldn't be happening for you, too busy refusing to allow the Lord to not only reward you when we get to heaven, but God says, if you're faithful over a few, I'll reward you. You don't, he says, what you do privately, and it's directed by the Spirit of God, he says, what you do privately, I will reward you openly. And so the spirit of inferiority kept Saul from becoming all that he could be. I believe there's going to be a lot of Christians who go to who, who end up leaving this earth, never really enjoying what God intended for them to do. Now, why is pride so dangerous? Let me just share quickly. There are serious consequences for the sin of pride. And one of the things, and when you get an opportunity, look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. The Bible says, in the last days, there will be perilous times. There's going to be an, a great apostasy from the church. And in these, in these uh, nine verses, there are at least four consequences that I want to quickly share with you that makes pride so dangerous in the life of, of believers. First of all, when pride is controlling us, it causes us to fall away from God and from others. Peter said it, he gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. It talks about what happens in the last day. There will be a great falling away. There will be perilous times. And the, the priority sin in that whole list of things is it's pride. Men will be boasters. They will be prideful. And then it gives a whole list of fruit that is birthed from a spirit of pride. And so when pride is in control, you cannot at the same time draw near to God because you don't see the need for God because you got this. 
It not only pushes you away from God, fall, cause you to fall away from God, you, you fall away from others. There are people who are struggling and need help, but their pride says, I don't want people in my business. I don't want people to think I'm weak. I don't want people to think that I'm a failure. Pride will keep you from reconciling. You, you hurt someone's feelings or someone hurt you. Your pride will say, I'm not telling them they hurt me. and I absolutely am not going to admit when I'm wrong. That's weakness. No, that's pride. That's pride. Well, if they came to me first, then I, no, 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 no. Pride will keep you from being obedient to the Lord. You will fall away from God when pride is in control. And one of the characteristics of the last day, the Bible says pride and boastfulness and all of the selfish fruits of that type of spirit. The scripture says you have not because you ask not. It's not a weakness to show your humanity. The Bible says bear one another's burdens. The strong should bear the infirmities of the weak. That we should restore one another. Here's a second uh, uh, car uh, a consequence of pride. This is what makes it dangerous. Fake spirituality that is based on superficial things rather than genuine substance. So there is falling away from God. Then there's fake spiritual growth. That is based on external things, not genuine growth. It says they will have a form of godliness, but deny the power. It says, and from such, stay away, turn away. When we are controlled by pride, we will under overestimate our spirituality. This happened in Mark in Matthew chapter 20. When the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said, when you get into the kingdom, Jesus, would you allow my boys, my macho uh, 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 sons to sit on your right hand, left hand side? And then Jesus asked them, are you able to handle the heat that comes with leadership? And they confidently and boldly said, we sure can. Remember what happened when the guards came and they took Jesus into custody? Guess who got ghosted? James and John, they took the fastest Uber, or Uber, Uber, the fastest Uber out of town, and they found a bunker, and they weren't going down there to inspect it. They went down there, unlike one of our leaders who said he went to inspect the bunker. No, they went to high. Jesus had to find those brothers, the ones who said, we can take the heat. Spirit, fake spirituality will make you think you all of that when you really are on Gerber's and spiritual similac. That's a danger. You will overestimate. You'll be writing spiritual checks that you can't catch. Failure to experience spirit. It also, a third thing is, it's, it's the failure to experience real spiritual growth. Real spiritual growth. The scripture says in verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, always learning. And never able to come to a knowledge of truth. You got every tape, every book, been to all the seminars, listen to all of the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the preaching and the teaching, but you never seem to grow. Well, I grow, I know a lot more than I used to. That's not growth. The Bible says, be doers of the word. Now, it doesn't matter if you have the information, but there's no application. Pride makes us unteachable. Now, this is not a person who doesn't read, who doesn't study routinely, or someone who lacks credentials and degrees, even in the, in, in the Bible and theology or some other uh, field of expertise. Now, this, the problem with an unteachable spirit because of pride is that the people, these kinds of people, they search for information to support what they already agree with or think they know. That's why people are so... Uh, polarized listening to Fox News or CNN. You're not listening to find out something new. You're listening in order for the newscasters to tell you what you already believe or what you think you already know. This perfect example that when you get an opportunity is Matthew chapter 22 verses 15 through 46. We're not going to read the verses. And the scripture talks about four groups of spiritual experts who came to Jesus and the Bible says they went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his word. They didn't come to learn anything. They came 
to embarrass Jesus. There were the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, and the scribes. And each of them had questions that they'd already debated and came to conclusions that nothing Jesus would have said was going to change their mind. But again, their intention was to trap Jesus. Prideful people are unteachable. They think they already know. Or they're very selective, again, in who they will allow to, to pour into their life. Even though what the, when Jesus corrected their error and they had no words to say, and the Bible says that the crowd that had gathered, they were amazed and astonished. And the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees, and the, uh, and the scribes walked away. They were embarrassed, but they were not convinced to change. They had not learned anything. And so you can ask the right questions, you can have the right answers, but that doesn't mean that you're teachable. Teachable means that you are willing to accept new truths and deeper understanding about things that you've learned so that God can continue to mold us and change us into the image of Jesus. And it doesn't matter. The Bible says a little child should lead them. And God can use anyone to speak into our lives his word that will enable us to get to where he is taking us regarding his, our potential and destiny and call that he has on our life. And so what happens is when, you, when we're filled with pride, you will fail to experience true growth and then you will have become susceptible to false doctrine. In verses 8 through 9, it talks about uh, two false teachers who influenced others to walk away from God when they rebelled against Moses in, in Exodus, a chapter, uh, uh, I, I believe it's chapter uh, 11, and don't, don't quote me directly on that, but uh, Paul talks about uh, uh, Jabez and, um, and, and, and Janus, how they taught false doctrine and led others. So when, you, when we're filled with pride, the Bible talks about we are easily deceived into believing things that are not true about the word of God. Often you talk to people and you show them the word of God and it, it, it's totally contrary to what they've been, what they said, what they watched on. on uh, they became an expert uh, just because they watched one video. And that's, that's the time that we live in. People have no basis of fact. They're just talking out of the side of their head and they're experts. And you can't convince them of anything that if you wear a mask, you will save a life. If you wear a mask, you can prevent yourself from connect, collect, connect, uh, correct, uh, from catching, contacting uh, uh, the COVID-19 disease. No, oh, that can't happen. And this is a, a freedom of speech. This is our independence. No, this is science. This is fact. Over 125 people have, have lost their lives, have died. More than 40,000 new people have contracted the coronavirus. But when you believe lies, false doctrine, false news reports, you will be gullible. Here's a, a, another thing that can happen. Force, force control that drives people rather than leads them. God has given you a spiritual gift. And when he gives you a gift, the Bible says, do we need to operate if you have been given the gift of giving, give. You've been given the gift of teaching, teach. If you've been given the gift of preaching, preach. But if you haven't been given that gift and you're trying to operate as if you have it, now you are outside of your anointing, outside of your purpose. And so because you're not walking in the path that God has predetermined, which it is his sovereign right to do, now what you're going to be doing Pushing your, putting yourself in a position where you're driving people rather than leading them because you can't lead them where God hasn't directed you to, to have authority. There'll be false control that drives people rather than leads them. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through, chapter 12, verses 4 through 8 about spiritual gifts. Operate in your lane. Don't try to operate outside of your anointing. It could cost you your life. Ask Uzzah, who was not a Levite, who tried to, to steady the ark and keep it from falling. The Bible says that God killed him that day. That was not his assignment. Even though someone asked him to fill in, he should have said, uh-uh, that's, that's not my anointing, that's not my call, that's not my gift. Here's a final consequence, and there are many more, but here's the final one. Fierce wrath from God. Fierce wrath from God. 
In Jeremiah chapter uh, uh, 50, verses 31 through 32, it says, Behold, I am against you, O haughty one, saith the Lord of hosts, for your day has come, the time that I will punish you. The most proud shall, shall, shall stumble and fall, and no one shall be able to raise them up. I will kinder a fire in his cities, and I will devour all around him. God says destruction and judgment is coming for those who don't repent. Well, how can we experience victory over pride? How can we experience victory over pride? I'm glad you asked. The first thing is attitude is key. Write that down. Attitude is key. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it said, let this mind, let this attitude that was in Jesus be in you. Jesus had a humble attitude. Awareness of who you are in Christ. Is, is, is crucial. The Bible says Jesus did not, in verse 6, regard equality with God as something he had to fight for, something he had to compete for. He knew who he was, even though he took on the form of a servant. Be aware of who you are in Christ. What God has for you is for you. Admit, allow others to be great. Allow others to be great. Don't make ministry hard. Don't make the work of God. Don't be a hindrance. Don't be a tool in the hand of Satan to prevent God from accomplishing his work in the life of others. The scripture says that Jesus voluntarily submitted to the will of God by taking on human form to accomplish what he was sent to earth to do, to seek and to save the lost, to reconcile those who had a who had fallen into sin and were now separated from God. He, he subordinated himself to God by voluntarily refraining from using all of his divine attributes all the time. He allowed God to be great in the moment in the sense that he came to glorify God as God's servant when he took on bodily form. Allow others to be great. Make that your commitment. I am going to encourage you to become everything that God wants you to be. I'm going to applaud you. I'm going to not be a roadblock. I'm going to be a conduit. I'm going to be an avenue. If this is of God, let's get it done. Admit when your pride is, when, 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 admit when our pride has risen up. The Bible says that Jesus emptied himself in order to die. We must die to pride every day. We must die to self-will every day. It is our nature to bow down at the altar of our flesh. And that's why Paul says, put to death the deeds of our flesh. And so we need to admit Jesus voluntarily died. Something has to die in order for God to rule and reign in our life so that we're not being controlled by our fleshly desires. Our fleshly desires are an indication that we are operating in the spirit of pride when we surrender to them. It's self-worship. Ask for forgiveness and forgive those who've injured you. One of the clearest evidences of a spirit of pride is that you're unforgiving. If we don't forgive others as Christ has forgiven us, somehow we have uh, elevated the wrongs of others above our own and have reduced the blood of Christ to insufficiency to eradicate and remove this, whatever the sin that pers the person has done for you. If you can't forgive it, that means that the blood of Christ is insufficient. If he can forgive your sins, past, present, and future, why can't you who, you, who say that you belong to him, forgive others as you've been forgiven? That's pride. And I'm, we'll talk about this next week about if you ever get loose, oh, the devil's a lie. He don't want you loose. Because we're the spirit of the, I'm telling you, if you are filled with pride, you'll never know what liberty in Jesus really means. Yeah, I seen you shout. I done heard you give your praise. I done watched you moonwalk in Jesus' name. But you ain't, you ain't experienced real freedom until you learn how to ask for forgiveness when you're filled with pride. And when I'm filled with pride and to forgive those who've hurt us. And here's the final thing. Accept God's timing to promote you. The Bible says after Jesus voluntarily died and refrained from using all of his dying divine attributes all the time, the Bible says that God gave him a name that was above every name and at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Those who are on the earth and under the earth will give 
reverence to Jesus. God has exalted the name of Jesus who's seated at the right hand of the Father. The scripture says your gifts will make room. Allow God to elevate you. Don't seek promotion in terms of uh, uh, doing, resorting to ungodly uh, ways and, 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 and to, to get in, into a position of recognition. Allow God to open doors for you. Now, as we close, most of you are familiar with the story of the, of the king uh, who, or the emperor who, who loved beautiful clothes. The king with, who loved beautiful clothes. He, this particular king would change clothes every hour. He was known for wearing the most exotic, most expensive, the most aesthetically attractive clothes. People would come from all around to just see what he had on on any given day at any given time. And so some Swindlers knew the, the king's tendency for arrogance. And so they convinced the king to let them come and make him a, a suit of clothes that no one had ever worn before. And that the clothes would be so unique that only the most intelligent and the most elite of his kingdom would be able to see these clothes. And so he agreed and they ordered gold and silver and silk and etc. that they hid for themselves while they worked on an empty loom. And so the king would call in his, his, uh, his cabinet on, from day to day to ask what did they think about the, the progress of his new outfit and what, not wanting to be thought of as stupid or non-elite. They would say, oh, magnificent, outstanding, you look all awesome. And then finally the king set up a time for a parade so everybody could see him strut his famous new outfit that was so unique that no one else in the entire world could brag that they had this in their, in their wardrobe. And so the day came and the king went out and all he had was a ribbon across his naked body and he's strutting and all the people saying, the king, the king looks marvelous, the king looks fantastic. Oh, what an amazing outfit. I've never seen anything so outstanding and, 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 and up, upstanding, et cetera. And so uh, out of the crowd, this little boy said, the king, the king is butt naked. The king is butt naked. He has no clothes on. And all of a sudden, there was a hush upon across the crowd. Everybody was silent. The king looked around. And it was at that time he started to feel a breeze. And then everybody else in the crowd said, the king has no clothes. The king has no clothes. And then, of course, he's trying to cover himself and, and, and sprint to back to the palace butt naked. And what that shows, again, is... Pride will make you think you clothed when you butt naked. Everybody sees you. They know you. They, 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 but they don't want to say to you because they don't want the, the, the conflict. Uh, they don't want you to dismiss them from your group. or uh, They don't want to, to do the battle of, as the Bible says, uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And so I don't want to be unclothed. I don't want to find myself uh, in a position where I can't be fully used of God because I have the spirit of pride. I'm worshiping at the altar of self glorification and self recognition. And so what, in order to overcome the me, me, me uh, 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 spirit, we need to commit ourselves to be like Jesus. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to serve others. And the reason I know that I can be a servant and I'm okay with it and operating in humility, a servant doesn't, have, doesn't struggle with being treated like one. How do you respond when somebody treats you like a servant? I want you to know that Jesus is looking for a few foot washers. He ain't looking for superstars. The Bible says that the least shall be the first. And those who are, it's a, the, the being in uh, leadership in the kingdom and being prominent in the kingdom, it's not a struggle for the top. It's a struggle for the bottom. It's not a struggle for self-recognition, but it's a struggle to give him the glory, to give him the honor, to bless his name, to let the world know that God has done this through me. And I'm grateful because I understand if it had not been for his mercies, I would be consumed. We cannot submit to the me, me, me spirit and be effective in the church. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you and we bless you in Christ's name. We also want to extend to those of you who, who may not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
One of the hardest obstacles to overcome to accept Christ as our Savior is to humble ourselves. The Bible says, accept you, come to Jesus as a little child. Not with a closed fist, but with an empty hand. The Bible says that those who need mercy will receive it. Blessed are the pure, pure in spirit. And those who are, poor, and who are poor, the Lord says they shall be made rich. We'll be made rich when we make that decision. Jesus, I need you. So if you're listening to me right now and you've never made a decision to trust Christ, I'm going to lead you into a, save, a, a saving knowledge of Christ through this prayer. Would you just repeat this prayer after me if you know that you want to finally surrender your life to Christ? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that Christ took my place voluntarily by dying on the cross, not for his own sins, but for my sins. Lord, I accept the finished work that he accomplished when Christ was buried and he rose on the third day and you accepted him back into heaven as a total and complete payment that cancels out all of my sins. I receive him right now by faith. Forgive me, Lord, of my sins. I accept Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Father, I thank you that you said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm calling on you right now, and I believe that you've saved me from the power, the penalty, and guilt of sin. Thank you, Jesus, for making me a part of your divine family through faith in the finished work of Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, would you pick up the phone? and make a call, leave a message so that we can follow up and begin to walk with you or find someone that you know that is a Christian that can begin uh, the ministry of, of, of helping you become more like Jesus. Let me share a benediction with you. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever, amen. Now join us shortly in the next five minutes uh, for our church town hall meeting. God bless you and we thank you in Christ's name, amen.